This is the Growth Enablement Madness Podcast, and here's your host, Jim Ward. Welcome to Growth Enablement Madness Podcast, your go-to source for growth enablement strategies, stories, and technologies. This is our first podcast, and I'm going to be introducing our guest, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about what does the phrase mean to me? Growth enablement means getting your entity, your organization, your company set up to be able to grow. Um, That can be uh, initiated through uh, people, process, and through technologies. Those are going to be the subjects that we tackle in this podcast. I've been the founder of BrainCell. I am the founder of BrainCell, 26 years in business. But uh, at our 23rd year, I realized we were we were a you know a traditional value added reseller of technologies, with the idea of helping folks advance. But it struck me we needed to evolve, um, and it became apparent you know with failure to adopt certain technologies, failure of certain companies to understand the work that really uh, is needed to drive technologies that we need to take a step back. We needed to have clients and customers take a step back and allow us to do some, go, just go deeper, to understand you know, what, what the people were or who they are in the organization, what they do, what are the processes that exist today. Uh, we don't wanna make a bad process go faster. And then, and then we look at technologies, but it's in that order. And so we took a much harder, deeper look at how companies run. We wanna look at five years out, where do they wanna be? And then we start applying technologies where they have impact. That sometimes means for a vendor, we need to slow the vendors down because they're selling licenses, they're coin operated, that's how they meet their stockholder uh, requirements. It's really not what we're about. We're not selling technology anymore, we're selling growth enablement. That's what it means to us. And so our first guest on our first podcast is Nick Ezzo. Welcome, Nick. Great to be here. Nice to have you with us on our first uh, uh, first podcast ever, and um, we, you and I, first chatted. What was it? A year or two ago? Yep, last summer. Last summer, um, and at that time, Nick was with one of our vendors, Sage Intact, and somebody had told me that you were really, uh, really in tune with technology stacks, and you were helping Sage Intact uh, grow significantly through the use of technologies that I look at as growth enabled. And then when you showed me the picture I saw, I thought, man, this guy knows this stuff. So maybe you can, you, can you just tell us a little bit about your background, you know, where you are today, what you've been up to, and then we'll launch into some other questions that I have for you. Cool. Awesome. Great to be here, Jim, on the inaugural podcast. I'm uh, honored to be the first victim or uh, recipient. Guinea pig. Uh, guinea pig. Um, yeah, my background, I don't know if you know this, but um, before I got into marketing um, 18, 19 years ago, um, I spent 10 years in IT. So I literally had a career before marketing doing um, systems implementation in the call center space. So um, I come from a technology background. So like, getting systems to talk to each other and stitching together systems is something I actually do and I, I love doing. And I like getting my hands dirty and picking up new technology and trying to use it to solve a problem. So um, did that for 10 years and then, you know, right around the, uh, the dot com burst, um, I received what I later found out is called a battlefield promotion, um, which is funny because nowadays I'm looking more and more like a Civil War general. Um, but, uh, you know, it, a, a battlefield promotion is when the company has to like lay off a, a ton of people and you end up taking on more responsibility. And my CEO at the time said, hey, hey, Nick, uh, you know, you know how to do web design? I'm like, uh, yeah, my band website. He's like, good enough. You're the webmaster. And um, <laughs> And he goes, you know, do you know how to do events? I'm like, well, I could throw a party. He's like, good enough. You're the events person too. So I literally went from like just doing a little bit of like customer marketing to being like in charge of a whole like demand gen function. So then it's like, all right, just figure it out. And so I read a lot, learned a lot, asked people lots of questions. Um, and so, you know, since 2001, this is what I've been doing. So 19 years later, here I am as a marketer. So a mar- marketing technologist, let's say. That's awesome. You know, you're a musician then too. Is that what I heard you say? You had a band? Um, yeah, um, I'm a guitar player, self-taught. Um, and yep. during this period where we're all at home now, I'm trying to teach myself how to play the banjo. Um, okay. I will not be playing the banjo on this podcast. Um, That's maybe a shame. Maybe future one. Um, still getting there. Okay. You know, it's funny. I find a lot of musicians uh, in this business and technology. So it must be that, that side of the brain. 
Yeah, maybe. I mean, you get a little analytical on this side, creativity on this side, and, you know, try to work them both together, you know. Maybe we'll have to insert some of your music in the uh, podcast along the way. <laughs> well, hey, so tell me a little bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay. Uh, my son's a musician, so I get it. Um, uh, so, Nick, you're now at Auditoria. Do I say that right? Auditoria. It's a, uh, our official name is Auditoria.ai. Tell me a little bit about Auditoria. What are you doing? Yeah, so Auditoria, who are we? Um, we literally just came out of stealth two months ago. So here we are, you know, July 8th today, as we're recording this. Um, we announced our, you know, here we are world um, mm -hmm. on Earth Day, April 22nd, 2020. So, you know, I never thought I would be launching a company in the midst of a pandemic, but we did and it can be done. So um, Auditoria, our, our mission is to improve the lives of finance people, right? So, you know, everybody, you know, you guys have, have CFOs in your backgrounds and you know people who are CFOs, um, people who are listening to this podcast, if you're a marketer, you know, the CFO is the person who's always asking you why you're spending so much money on your marketing technology and your marketing programs. So we, we love finance people and we want to take um, our technology, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, OCR, NLP, all these you know, word salad of acronyms and take this technology and apply it to a finance problem because we believe that finance people tend to work nights, weekends, holidays. They tend to solve problems by just throwing more bodies at the problem. And mm -hmm. we think that's a shame. So we've got some pretty cool tech and at Auditoria, we're trying to um, apply artificial intelligence to the finance function. That's terrific. That sounds interesting. Maybe we can learn about a little bit more about that as we go along. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Nick, um, we, when I back, when we first chatted, I had seen your, your tech stack, you shared it with me. Um, and I'm still, I still look at it a lot, by the way, and uh, share it with others. So I'm a big fan about what you've done. You know, there was something that I wanted to talk to you about, which is this concept of an all-in-one marketing automation. Um, you know, we've got a lot of, when you see a tech stack, there's, there's a lot of products that seem to be integrated. So can you tell me a little bit about what you think all-in-one marketing automation looks like? Yeah, sure. And, and before I go there, I, I kind of want to like give you my philosophy about automation to yeah. kind of lay the groundwork because like why automate anything is, is a good question. You know, mm -hmm. some people, you know, people who don't understand technology sometimes think that what we have is a bunch of toys and we just want to play with our toys and, Oh, you marketers, you have all this money and you have these budgets and you have a new toy over here, a new toy over there. That's, that's, yeah. That's an uninformed, uninformed opinion, in my opinion. Um, when I think about technology and what we're trying to solve for, whether it's an all-in-one automation or, or point solutions that you can stitch together into kind of a best of breed, um, I, I'm reminded of a story about um, sailing ships 200 years ago. So 200 years ago, even 100 years ago, Jim, if you wanted to operate a sailing ship, like one of these tall-masted schooners or clippers, um, you would need 100 men or people, in fact, there were women who worked on those ships. In fact, uh, I'll tell you a story a different day about a very famous navigator who was a woman, uh, set the record for um, a sailing ship going from Spain, I think, to San Francisco. But you know, you need 100 men and women to run the ship. You'd need um, people to rig the sails. If it's a battleship, you need people to work the cannons. If you, you, know, you, you didn't have navigation, so you had somebody up in the crow's nest who's looking out for enemy ships and looking for land. Um, and of course, of course, you need the captain to command and control the vessel, right? True story, today's modern battle cruisers require only four people to operate. You need somebody on um, propulsion to operate the engines. You need somebody on munitions if you're going to fire the cannons. You need somebody um, on navigation. We don't have a crow's nest, but now we have a computerized navigation system. And of course, you need the captain to command and control the vessel. How is this possible? Well, through technology and through computerization, automation, technology, um, having good data, having clean data. Um, and so, when I think about that, I, I don't have a hundred men. I don't have a hundred people. I don't have a hundred marketers. Um, when I was at Host Analytics or at Intact, I had a dozen, maybe maybe a couple dozen, but I don't have a hundred. But I was competing with very large companies that are multinational companies that had hundreds of people competing with me. And so I can't outgun them. I can't throw more bodies at the problem. So I'm using technology to build my marketing unit into a battleship, a computerized automated battleship. So I could have the smallest number of people make the largest impact. So Questions about that before I move into the all-in-one question? Well, no, I, that goes right to my point about growth enablement. Uh, I often talk about growth and scale. Sometimes they're two different things for me, right? So um, that analogy is great. So if you think about scale, this is what I believe, and I'd like to see what, what your thoughts are around it. Um, there is a, uh, you know, with adding, uh, with applying technology in the right place, at some point, just like the battleship, I think, 
there's no need for more human capital to, in order to fuel or grow uh, the company or the entity. Yeah, uh, perhaps efficient. having throwing more your bodies actually makes you less efficient. Makes you less efficient, right? So once you hit that tipping point and you're able to find the right places to apply technology, and you're able to uh, allow each human to become uh, maybe a force multiplier with the technology. To me, that's the tipping point for profitability, right? So you're not adding human capital. You're allowing folks to be more successful. They're perhaps making more money, uh, but actually a smaller cost of the total company uh, in a cost structure. So it's a tipping point. Would, would you agree with that scaling concept with that battleship metaphor? Yeah, totally. And I would call it a step change function. So, you know, when you, if you apply people, it's very linear and you end up, you know, as I said earlier, and when I interrupted you, you adding more people actually makes you less efficient because at some point you got to manage people and you can only have right. a certain number of people you're managing and, and they got, you know, one-on-ones that you have and an expense reports you got to deal with. Um, but when you apply some technology, if you do it smartly and it's mm -hmm. got a clear ROI and, and you know what your, what your objective is, it becomes a, a you said force multiplier. I call it a step function. Same thing. It's, mm -hmm. you know, now, now you're not growing linearly. You're growing exponentially and you're, and you're bending that curve. Right. Right. It's interesting. We just, just are finishing a blog on that. So that's, that's a great point. Um, well, with the technologies that we're talking about today, uh, what are some of the technologies that you find are uh, fueling growth effectively? Yeah, so I'll go back to your, your question about the all-in-one versus best of breed. And, and this, yeah. is, this is one where it, it's, there's no one-size-fits-all uh, answer. Um, you know, I'm a small company. You know, we're just starting out. Um, we just, you know, in, in a matter of three months, we stood up a website. We created some content. We needed a marketing automation system. I'm very, very familiar with Marketo, having used it at um, mm -hmm. three companies prior. Right. I decided I wasn't going to use Marketo at my current company. I'm going to use HubSpot. You know, okay. it's cheap. It's, um, it's very powerful. Does a lot of different things. And you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I needed a Swiss Army knife. You know, and mm -hmm. because if you think about the Swiss Army knife analogy, um, a Swiss Army knife does a lot of different things, but it doesn't do any of them particularly well, right? You got that little pair of scissors, but if you're going to cut something, you don't want a little pair of scissors. You want a good yeah. pair of scissors. You know. Right. You, it might have like a, I don't know, a, a screwdriver in it, but you know, if you actually need the, you know, the torque, you're going to want to use an actual screwdriver, right? Mm -hmm. So a Swiss Army knife does a lot of things, but it does them all kind of eh. Um, contrast that with best of breed. Um, over time, I may change out parts of my technology stack. I might adopt more of a best of breed approach where I'm going to fit components in there and maybe replace some of the, the all-in-one um, with different best of breed components. But the, the, the thing to keep in mind is when you have an all-in-one marketing system like, like HubSpot, and I'm not on the payroll for them, they're not paying me, I, I didn't write it in my contract that, that I'm gonna endorse them in any way, shape, or form, I'm just telling you as a marketer. Um, yep. You know, it, it does everything I need it to do, and, and the, the, the integration where it's all under the skins, it's all under one mm -hmm. thing, and I don't have to try to tie anything together here, it just takes one more thing off my plate so I can actually focus on marketing and not trying to troubleshoot systems problems. So, so do you think that lends itself the all-in-one to a smaller company or uh, whereas you can manage less or is that? Yeah, yeah I think that's a fair statement. Um, now, you know, folks in product marketing at HubSpot are probably like, if they hear this, they're like, no, 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 we're all sizes. You know, we're not just right. SMB. Of course. You yeah. know, okay, great. I mean, I'm, I'm not in marketing over there, but I'll tell you, as a small company with a limited budget, um, yep. I had massive budgets at my two previous companies that were like seven figure plus, you know, budgets. Um, I don't have that. So I got to make right. do with what I can. We got to be scrappy. We got to use our, you know, do everything on a shoestring and, you know, be smart about every single decision we make because, you know, right and wrong decisions at a company our size, you know, the chance of error, you don't have a lot of chances to, to make up for lost time. So um, right. I, I think for our, I can only speak for us and companies like us, um, small companies getting started, an all-in-one marketing solution, gets you going. Yeah, yeah. No, that's our experience uh, with many of the clients. So when we get the chance and we're allowed to really do that upfront uh, blueprint, understanding, you know, the people, the process, the size of company, all those things, the demographics, uh, we're able to fit the right technology. So perhaps it's a HubSpot, perhaps it's something bigger, bigger like Marketo, uh, but it's finding that right technology for the company. Uh, there are lots of other uh, technologies out there besides HubSpot. Um, and uh, although I hate to use this term uh, bargain bin, uh, yeah. sometimes, um, and it's because it's the wrong analogy. Uh, none of these, all of these companies are great companies. They have great products. It's all a matter of how you apply them, use them. But sometimes you might not have the budget for that big product. And so you go bargain bin. Mm -hmm. uh, and the all-in-one marketing automation perhaps is a better cost-effective approach. So um, uh, besides HubSpot, where you, who else is in that category that you perhaps looked at? Did you think of others? 
Um, when we were looking at marketing automation? Yeah, marketing automation or that one platform. So I think, you know, um, well, maybe I think Sugar has a platform today, for example. They've got- maybe Salesforce has, Salesforce, we use Salesforce for our CRM. So, I mean, we actually have HubSpot, but we don't use their CRM component. We actually use Salesforce, which is right. interesting because our philosophy there was- That's interesting. Well, you know, we're, we're hiring salespeople. You know? So we, we started with one salesperson. We're adding on to the, the, the sales team. Salesforce is kind of the de facto standard in high-tech sales. So if you're mm. hiring high-tech salespeople, do you want to train them on how to use a new system and on how to sell your product? No. Um, so, you know, assuming that most salespeople already know how to use Salesforce, um, in, at least in the San Francisco Bay area in which I live, um, we chose Salesforce. Now I'm very, very familiar with Salesforce having right. used that in the last probably five companies I've worked at going all the way back to like 2001. Um, you know, so I know, I know Salesforce like the back of my hand. Um, but you know, we they have they have Pardot and they have other you know yeah. marketing automation platforms within that. There's also Acton. You know, it's also kind of an all-in-one encompassing thing. Um, you know, there's there's other ones that are uh, startups that you know maybe we don't even know their names, but there's a lot of them that are out there that are you know trying to trying to like take advantage of the complacency of companies like Oracle Marketing Cloud, aka right. Eloqua, Eloqua, Marketo. Right. With, Formerly known as Marketo, now Adobe, yeah. whatever yeah. they are. But yep. you know, they, they've been a little bit complacent, I will say, and maybe they will dispute that, but they've taken their customers for granted. There's a lot of upstart companies who are trying to take their lunch. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I see that, of course, in the marketplace. And uh, again, about budget, you know, Salesforce being the big brand, uh, folks know them. Uh, in your case, very familiar with them. Uh, companies like the Sugars, who have created the platform with Sugar Market, Sugar Sell, uh, Sugar Serve, they're all starting to get into that sort of fray as well. Uh, HubSpot's doing the same thing. They're expanding. And I think that goes to an upsell, cross sell to existing customer base. I think that's a value to them as well. Um, but yeah, all good, good points. So um, I'm a little bit interested uh, in hearing uh, from you about things like um, the components, maybe not in this all-in-one, some of the components that you use. Um, I, I spent a lot of time looking at unique components because I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to this. And I do find it fun. It's a bit of a video game. So what are the, some of the cool components you've, you've come across? Yeah, well, um, the cool components uh, that we have come across are all in support of, of our account-based marketing strategy. So, okay. um, you know, while we are doing some inbound, um, you know, we've got some limited display, uh, some Google AdWords that are floating around out there, and we're doing some email marketing, we're doing webinars, things you would imagine that any, any, any company would do to try to get the attention of their buyer. Yep. We're a nascent industry, like it, artificial intelligence in finance or even finance automation. It, it, people aren't searching for that, right? I, I came from a company that's a, a accounting software uh, or ERP manufacturer, if you will. Um, yep. I know what the average um, local searches and the, the global monthly searches are for, for those search terms. And they're huge. People are searching for that stuff. There is intent mm -hmm. data around, you know, budgeting software and accounting software and all that stuff. Ain't nobody searching for artificial intelligence in finance. Not now. My job is to get them to search right. for that. But until and unless they search for us, I need to search for them. I need to find them. So in addition to our inbound strategy, we've adopted an account-based strategy. And we have a total addressable market of, let's say, 14,000, 15,000 companies we want to go after. Mm -hmm. We've applied some other algorithms to that to bring that down to about 1,000. And then the head of sales and I literally hand curated a list of 100. We call it 100 accounts. Technically, it's 92 accounts. Okay. Um, no more, no less. And, and those are companies that we believe are receptive to our message, that we know somebody there, we can get an in. Um, they kind of look like people we want to sell to or people we've sold to. And so that's our account-based strategy. Now we have that list of 92 accounts, or top 100, if you will. And we're encircling those accounts with a, a lot of different um, channels, tactics. Okay. Um, so of course we're doing email marketing. Everybody's yep. doing it. Um, email, although the, the, the demise of email has been long predicted, it's still around and yep. I'm still getting spammed every day. You know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 to 12, it's the spamming hour. And that's when my inbox gets full of marketing messages. Right. Um, but, you know, we're also sending swag. So I use Sendoso for swag. Yeah. Um, in other lifetimes, I've used PFL and, and others. Um, but we decided to use Sendoso. Um, I'm using uh, Rollworks or AdRoll for my display advertising. We've got an account-based advertising program where we're encircling those accounts with display ads um, specific to them and their companies. Um, in former times, I used Terminus. Um, I used Sixth Sense. All great companies. Um, stop you there. Let me stop you there. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You've made you say six cents, uh, and I'm thinking COVID, remote workers, intent. 
Mm -hmm. six, for those who don't know about Sixth Sense, they are the, the company that uncovers the dark funnel, I think. I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but mm -hmm. the dark funnel, whereas there's uh, folks searching for, you know, uh, finance. You say they're not searching for AI for finance, but if they were, uh, Sixth Sense, Bombara, they would start to uncover that intent. And um, as a part of folks who don't know, but I think that uh, about, you know, it's been said about 70% of research has already been done before they actually become a part of your uh, lighted funnel, become, exactly. a, you become aware of them. So you want mm -hmm. to get to them and influence them before during that 70% stage. But with the pandemic, what's your thoughts around Sixth Sense, Dark Funnel, Intent, folks at home, IP addresses now? Yeah, well, it's, it's crazy. Um you know, I'm very familiar with demand base and their reverse IP and, and other uh, cookie based technology that augments that um, IP address to domain resolution. Um, I'm very familiar with Kickfire. In fact, you know, I actually helped start that company with, with Tina and Steven like 15 years ago around a dinner table in, in, in Los Gatos. So, you know, Kickfire, formerly known as um, Visistat. Um, and I, I know Sixth Sense extremely well. Um, and, you know, I, even my own website, because I use HubSpot. Um, a lot of my visitors for the last three months have been coming from Comcast, AT&T, Uverse, and Verizon, because guess yeah. what? We're all working from home. Right. Not too many people in the office. So um, I think that this whole uh, IP to domain resolution thing has, has taken a hit because now we, we, we know that people are hitting the site and we know that you know they're coming from somewhere, but we're not always sure that they're coming from a corporate domain. In fact, unless they're logged into their VPN, they're probably not coming from a corporate domain. Yeah. So right. um, I think temporarily, at least while we're all working from home, um, those types of technologies are going to be slightly less effective. They're not going to be completely wiped off the table because, as you know, demand base and, and kick fire and six cents, they do a whole bunch of other stuff besides yeah. that. Um, that's not really the underpinning of their whole system. If it was, they'd be in big trouble. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that one particular technology was an unexpected casualty of the, of the pandemic. Okay. And uh, email, you know, you're right. Uh, I'm getting, you know, bombarded with email. Uh, I'm interested in the space like uh, Conversica and Exceed. Do you know those two companies uh, yeah. and the AI-based ba uh, outbound emailing? Uh, yeah. Are you guys using any of that right now or is that uh, something you've used? I, I've reached out to Conversica and I've started my free trial. Uh, I used Conversica at my previous two companies. It's great. It's awesome. People don't know what it is. It's a it's a, an automated bot that kind of looks like a sales assistant. Maybe it looks like your best SDR, your best BDR. Um, and it, it's, it uses a, a very basic script and it, it adapts and learns. And based on what the person says, it, it comes up with a, you know, a response. And so I think it's a, it's a great way to scale. We don't have SDRs. I'm trying to, you know, thinking about using that. Same thing with chat. Sure. You, know, you know, I used Drift at my previous company. Um, used um, Live Person a couple companies ago. Um, HubSpot, again, Swiss Army Knife, they've got a chat function. Don't know how do. it works. I don't know how good it is, but I'll probably give it a shot before I, you know, call one of these other, other vendors. But um, about email, uh, I'm going to give you my personal opinion, and this is to every SDR, BDR that's listening out there. Okay. Thank you for sending that email to bump it up to the top of my inbox, but I don't really need things to bump <laughs> up to the top of my inbox. If I did, you know, feel free to bump it up every day, but I really wasn't looking for that. So. Just saying. I understand. Yeah, you got to cut through the noise. Bumping it up to the top of the email box isn't working for me, and neither is the COVID and pandemic stuff at the top. Yeah, totally. You know what does work, though, Jim? Authenticity. Yeah. Um, crafting an email that's well thought out, that shows you've done some research into who your subject is and you know, who the recipient is and what their problems right. are. You know, like, like maybe you give a crap. You know, just show that you're authentic and, and yeah. you try. You know, um, too many of, of the SDRs and BDRs in the world um, – or rely on some some scripts in, that somebody created these these sequences in outreach or tout app or sales loft or whatever yep. that, um, that, that their, their manager created for them it's like i, I think it's a, it's a shame and yep. you know and what, what also happens is um sdrs and, and folks they, they tend to like find something that works and then ride that until it's a dead horse like i mean you remember a couple of years ago the hey i haven't heard from you in a while check one of the above or have you been swallowed by alligators are you trapped under a rock it's like no um i'm actually really busy and i have a freaking job and my job isn't to reply yes. to bdrs because if it was i'd be doing it all freaking day long yeah. so yeah. you know those those things kind of peaked out over a while and i haven't gotten any in a while because it's just like yeah it, it worked like the first week but guess what we adapt and we kind of get tired of it right 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 uh so so tell me uh what's working for you right now what do you think is if you had a if you had, had a, a, a top three. Well, um, how much do I want to share? <laughs> well, that's that's a good point. I, uh, yeah, I will I will share a couple of general tips. Um, before the whole pandemic, first of all, let me hypnotize you. 
for them. Yeah, just... exactly. Okay, <laughs> we'll see. Share um, everything. Uh, so we were fortunate enough before everything went sideways to have um, eight or 10 CFOs in our office um, over a period of a day. And I had a film crew there. And I just asked some questions, you know, I asked some questions about the problems and, you know, you know, what's, what's the, what's the hardest part about finance? If you could wave a magic wand and solve one problem, what it would be. And I just had a conversation, I had an authentic conversation with them. And I, I had like 10 hours of footage, which is on a hard drive right over here on my desk. And, you know, over the last few months, I've taught myself video editing. I'm using Adobe Premiere. I give a shout out to Adobe. And I, I put these uh, videos out there. It's called the CFO Corner. Um, and then I had those transcribed using a service called rev.com, which for about a buck a page, mm -hmm. will transcribe your video into a text. Then I just take that and give it to my, you know, 18 year old who's downstairs. Um, he's got nothing to do this summer. And hey, dude, can you edit this for me into an interview? Okay, great, mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and now I can post that as a blog post. So, um, well, so there's a few things that work for me there. One, video always works. Yep. You know, this is yep. great. Yep. We're doing this remotely, but you know, video is awesome. Um, yep. Podcasts are great. You can slice and dice it. You can turn this into a blog post. Um, you can reuse content. And then the last little secret I'll give you is um, I alluded before to this kind of BS about the best time to send emails is Tuesdays and Thursdays between 10 a.m. and 12 a.m. It's like 12 p.m. It's like, yeah, okay, great. That's the, now it becomes the spamming hour, which everybody's trying to cram their stuff into that thing. I actually send email on Saturdays and Sunday mornings and I send them to CFOs because I know for a fact that C-level people check their inboxes on weekends, right? Even before we were all stuck at home, you know, you, know, you see people at the grocery store, you see them at their kid's soccer game, they can't help it. You know, we're, we all have this fear of missing out and we're, you know, checking this thing constantly. And, you know, I send a, a very light touch email on a Saturday morning saying, hey, Jim, you know, you're the CFO. Um, here's a couple of pieces of content that you might find interesting. Just give them some light reading, something to do. Always give them something of value. Don't ask for something in return, just, but just keep giving them something of value until one day they might want to talk to you. So a bit of a deposit, making that deposit. And you know, that's funny because on the Saturday and Sunday, I do read uh, the emails and I'm relaxed. So I'm also mm -hmm. taking it in probably. I think that's a great idea. Don't worry. Nobody's listening to the podcast anyway. So you didn't share anything. <laughs> It's just you and I. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Um, so I went back to the email, and you're right. I think personalization is everything, and that, and and when you go to an ABM approach, you can be more personal. You have uh, to. Be. You have to be right. So, um, but you, but with the ABM approach, you know, ABM used to have, and I heard you say, uh, you know, you might send some swag. Sendoso, I think, is who you mentioned. Direct mm -hmm. mail, but with also COVID. How's that impacted? Are we able to get direct mail or yeah, a swag man. to people? Yeah, good question. Yeah, it's because it's like, that was another question. It's kind of like a reverse IP lookup. Okay, we, we know your corporate address. You know, um, I, I know where to send a package. But if you work at the headquarters office, I go on your website. You know, I can yeah. turn an intern or have, you know, my 17, 18 year old downstairs and you know, do some research and figure out where to send this package. But I don't know your home address. I don't want to know your home address. It would be creepy if I knew your home address to send you a box of chocolates. It'd be really weird, Jim. Um, <laughs> but um, a lot of these guys, I know Sendoso has this. They, they actually... I talked to their product team and they accelerated the development of this one feature um, where before they send a package, they send an email. So, hey, Jim, um, Nick from Auditoria would love to send you a box of chocolates. Um, to, to receive this package, click confirm your delivery address or feel free to enter another delivery address where you'd like the chocolates to be sent. And we promise we won't store this information. We'll only use it to deliver the stuff and, um, and we'll delete it afterward. And so that works great. Um, uh, PFL, I, I, I think, has come up with something similar to that because everybody has to if you want to stay in business. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I think a lot of these vendors have been smart and because they want to stay in business and keep doing what they do, they've been able to adapt and evolve. That's a great idea. I hadn't even thought about that. Uh, or have I, hmm. So, and they assure security of data. That's right. And now, I mean, with PII, GDPR, and um, CCPA, and all these acronyms, you know, we, we, we care a lot about people's data and we certainly do not want to know where their home address is. Um, that, it, yes, we are super sensitive and, and these companies are also super sensitive to that. So they, they make a very clear, bold faced font. Um, right. We will not store your personal information. So with an ABM approach, you've got the 92 or the, or the 100 uh, which I believe in. I believe in having a very focused approach today. It's really, I think, if you, by the way, I think email is, is still relevant, but I think it takes volume. Yeah. Uh, so it has to be extremely relevant. Um, in your ABM approach, are you, you're taking different channels to touch these 92? That's right. Um, so we've got, we've got display advertising, we've got swag, we've got an email component, we've got a calling component. 
um, you know, we're, we're reaching out to them on social, you know, um, yeah. find them on LinkedIn, find them on LinkedIn, find out what they're, you know, where they go to school, you know, yeah. what's their alma mater and find out what your connection is, you know, Hey, you know, Jim, you and I both know Brian, you know, at brain cell, you know, Hey, Brian says you're a great guy. So, you know, yeah. so find that, you know, use the, the social networking, um, get creative. Uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, going back to 2008, I worked for a company and there were 20 accounts that the whole company was going after 20 accounts, not 21, right. not 25, not 30, 20. Yep. God help the sales rep who was freelancing and wasn't working one of the 20 accounts that the company had decided to work on. Yeah. That's the definition of a focused approach. I mean, that you don't get any more focused than that. Maybe you can get right. five accounts or one account, but, um, and these were big blue chip accounts where we'd done some research. We thought we had a good chance of winning. And at the end of the day, um, ABM is a focused thing. It's a targeted thing. It's, it's a way to hone your, your focus down to a, a, a group of accounts that you can give a lot of love to and you can get creative and, and give them a lot of love in a lot of different ways. And it's up to us as marketers to come up with those ways. Um, uh, I, I worked with a CFO not too long ago and uh, he, he kept trying to solve the problem. How do we do ABM at scale? How do we do ABM at scale? It's like, dude, like those two things are diametrically opposed. You either are doing very tight focused things or you're doing scale. And you yeah. know, the way that you, when you mesh those things together, I don't know, man, maybe you'll create a singularity and suck us all into it and the universe will cease to exist. But, you know, I just don't think that, that is possible. Is, is there an average deal size that make ABM uh, more appropriate? So when you're dealing uh, with the 92 or the 20? Well, it's, um, you can spend as much as you want as long as you are um, not exceeding the lifetime value of that customer, right? So this is a, right. a simple math problem, right? Every, right. every company has their own. Um, CAC ratio, your customer acquisition costs, and, and the ratio of the customer acquisition costs to the lifetime value of the customer. Some companies want payback within a year. Some people want you know, uh, pay, payback within two years or whatever. But um, there's no hard and fast rule. It has to do with how um, important that account is to you in terms of dollars in your bank account. Um, the strategic importance of that logo on your wall at headquarters or on your website. Is it going to be a domino that's going to open up other doors and uh, open up a new vertical for you and give you new expertise? So um, I think the answer to that question is going to vary based on um, who the company is. But yep. I think if you want to do an account-based approach and you're going to spend, let's say, thousands of dollars, then the thing that you sell should be worth more than thousands of dollars, like many yes. thousands of dollars. You can't spend $5,000 to, to sell a $100 widget. It just doesn't make any sense and you go out of right. business in the first week. Well, this has been great information, uh, Nick. Tell me uh, or tell the folks out there, the thousands of people listening to us today. Thousands of the throngs. The th yes, because this is going to draw everybody. It's viral. You know that it's viral after this. Uh, tell me a little bit. Of, tell me how, would you like them to contact you? And if they did, how would they get a hold of you? Well, um, absolutely. You can find me on Twitter, um, at sign Nick A. Ezzo, N-I-C-K, letter A, E-Z-Z-O. That's great. You can follow me. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn slash, 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 whatever, Nezzo. Um, my current email address for the foreseeable future is nick.ezzo at auditoria.ai. Um, or, you know, watch this podcast and, you know, comment in the section below. You know? Yeah, so folks, I encourage you to follow Nick. Uh, he's been a great source of information for me. I'll continue to touch base with you, Nick. Uh, we're Brain Cell. Follow us. Uh, we're braincell.net. Uh, soon to be braincell.com. Uh, and we're about growth enablement. And like I said earlier in this, this podcast, we're not selling technology. We're selling growth enablement. And I, what I really want to be able to do for clients and, and, and customers is to be able to not only get them on a growth enablement path, uh, to meet their, obje their, their objectives over five years, but we'll also place uh, folks who are called customer success managers for their lifetime. We want to manage that journey with you. So, Nick, thank you very much. We look forward to talking to you soon. This is Growth Enablement Madness. <laughs>